Hi, everyone. Uh, as she said, my, my name is Ben Kaiser. I'm a, a student in the graduate program at Princeton University. I just started this semester. And uh, my co-authors on this work are Mireya Harado and Alex Ledger. And so uh, we set out to try to understand um, how motivated, capable, and overall credible of a threat China is to Bitcoin. And the reason we pursued this research is that there's been a lot of discussion about this topic in the community for years. Uh, there's a lot of fear, I think, about this threat in certain parts of the community. And so we wanted to provide um, some more rigor to this discussion and produce a, a useful threat model that could actually be, uh, could actually inform researchers who are trying to design mitigations to this particular threat and other types of uh, state level threats. So uh, let me give you an outline for uh, the next 20 minutes. I'll start by uh, talking about sort of broadly why we and, and others in the Bitcoin community uh, are worried about China as a threat. Uh, I'll overview political goals and incentives in China very broadly. I'll talk about China's capabilities to influence Bitcoin, both uh, technical and regulatory. And I'll conclude with a taxonomy of the specific threats that China poses to Bitcoin. Um, and before I do that, I just want to say, uh, I'm going I'm to talk about, you know, I'm going to use the word China a lot during this talk. And what I'm specifically referring to uh, when I say that are a few groups in China with policymaking power around Bitcoin. So this includes um, the leadership of the PRC, the leadership of the Communist Party in China, which is uh, effectively the only national political party, and then also leaders of Bitcoin businesses in China. So these groups operate according to uh, many, not all, but many of the same uh, incentives and goals. Um, and they're also subject to the authority of a fairly small number of regulators. And I'll, I'll talk about that last point more in more detail. Uh, but for now, let's dive in. Uh, the reason that a lot of people are uh, concerned about uh, China's threat to Bitcoin is that they challenge some fundamental security assumptions in Bitcoin's design. Um, the first assumption is that no individual party can amass too much power over the consensus process. And this is usually expressed in terms of mining power. And uh, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, China has a really powerful position in the mining ecosystem between uh, manufacturing of the ASICs that are actually used for mining, uh, control over uh, actual like hash power that's located in the country of China, and then also management of uh, mining pools where the managers themselves are, are based in China or affiliated with Chinese uh, companies. So uh, there's sort of a direct conflict here between uh, China's position in the ecosystem and this, this fundamental security assumption. Uh, the other assumption that China pushes up against is that uh, all miners are following uh, rational economic incentives. And uh, China's challenge here is that they've expressed high-level political goals uh, that are just sort of directly in conflict with Bitcoin. Uh, and these types of high-level political goals can easily supersede the economic incentives of a system like Bitcoin. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's dive into uh, the political goals and incentives in China. And we break these up broadly into two categories. Uh, the first are political goals that are directly in conflict with Bitcoin. So uh, goals that cannot be achieved in a world where Bitcoin is secure and usable in China. Uh, the first is uh, policies of, of social control, primarily through censorship and surveillance of online activity. Uh, online speech is, is fairly tightly controlled in China. Uh, if you want to post on uh, a major online platform, you have to provide personal information for verification by the government. Uh, these platforms are responsible for uh, reporting and censoring dissenting or banned speech to the government. Uh, and anonymity tools like uh, VPNs and Tor have been made extremely difficult to use in China. On top of that, there's been an effort in recent years to uh, track consumer spending habits. Uh, primarily, uh, this is possible due to the rise of uh, digital payments in China, which are extremely popular, uh, far more so than they are uh, in the US or other countries. And these platforms can provide consumer spending data to the government uh, as part of the, um, the social credit score system uh, that's, that's been rolled out. So uh, Bitcoin, of course, is designed to provide uh, censorship resistance and uh, protect the privacy of its users to the degree possible. Uh, so we see a direct conflict here uh, between these political goals and the technical properties that Bitcoin is designed to provide. Uh, the second set of political goals that are a conflict uh, with Bitcoin are their economic policy. So, so very broadly speaking, Chinese economic policy is protectionist. Uh, capital is very tightly controlled, especially uh, capital outflow like uh, foreign investments or, or capital flight. Uh, on top of that, uh, we've seen a consolidation of regulatory authority in China. Uh, there, and this is especially noticeable around the financial sectors. So there used to be three separate committees that oversaw uh, banking, insurance, and securities regulation. And now there's just one committee that oversees all of these. So you know, 
But by its nature, Bitcoin is designed to provide sort of a free flow of money. And again, this, this directly conflicts with uh, tight controls over capital. And it's also designed to resist centralized control. And so as we see a consolidation of regulatory authority, uh, there's, there's a challenge there as well. Uh, the other set of political goals um, that are at odds with Bitcoin are uh, goals that could motivate China to exert control over Bitcoin or, or sort of use their control over it to their own ends. So uh, first, uh, China is a, a single party, a single ideology state that has been pretty aggressively pursuing repression of dissenting ideas in recent years. Uh, Bitcoin's sort of promise as a, as a manifestation of decentralized control ideology is, is directly in conflict with, uh, with this type of, um, of political system. Uh, on top of this, uh, we've seen much more assertive foreign policy from China in the last few years. They have a stated goal to be uh, a global technology leader, not just in the supply chain where they've led for decades, but now also in um, lots of you know, Finnish technology products and services. So controlling Bitcoin, or even better, replacing it with a Chinese-controlled system, would, would directly help achieve this goal of uh, being a global technology leader. And, and more broadly, it would help give them control over the global flow of money. We've also seen more um, deployment of soft power for political influence campaigns in uh, foreign countries. So far, this has mostly taken the form of um, uh, attempts to sort of um, bring together Chinese expatriates into organizations that can advocate politically in these countries and also uh, political donations uh, in, in foreign countries with the goal of influencing public thought and policymaking in these countries. So control over Bitcoin would grant China additional leverage and soft power in places where it's used widely or where it's a significant economic sector. Okay, so let's move on and talk about the specific capabilities that China has to affect Bitcoin. Uh, and there are three that I'm going to overview here. Uh, the first and, and probably the most important is uh, China's capability to control Bitcoin mining. So we know that at least 25% of all the hash power in Bitcoin is actually geographically located in China. Uh, it's in sort of big mining centers that, that look like this. And uh, the, the study that this number comes from was uh, out of University of Cambridge last year. Basically what they did was uh, they were able to attribute about in total half of uh, Bitcoin's network hash power to specific mining facilities like these by looking at uh, energy consumption. And of the uh, half that they were able to identify, half of that was located in China. So that's where 25% comes from. Uh, the true number is probably at least a little bit higher than that. Uh, on top of the hash power that's sort of directly controllable by China, uh, there's also uh, a huge concentration of mining pool power that is uh, managed by uh, people affiliated with uh, Chinese organizations, businesses. Uh, right now, at least when I put these slides together a few weeks ago, this was at uh, 74%. But you can see from this chart, uh, the blue represents the percentage of the network hash rate controlled by Chinese affiliated mining pools, and the green is all other mining power combined. And it's been above 50% since 2015. Now, this hash power is not directly controllable by China in the same way that the domestic hash power is. But because the pool managers control the, uh, the jobs that these miners work on and the, the way in which the blocks they find are propagated, they control the inputs and outputs of these miners' efforts. And so there are ways in which these miners could be directed to undermine Bitcoin potentially without even knowing it. And uh, we'll see a little more about how this could happen when I get to the, uh, the attack overview. Uh, the, the last point I want to make here is about uh, ASIC manufacturing. Uh, again, as everyone knows, the vast majority of, of Bitcoin ASICs uh, are produced in China. Um, market estimates are around 70 to 80 percent. And um, the, the threat that I've seen discussed around this area is about uh, backdoors in, in ASICs. I don't think this is really a major threat because uh, you know, it would be a major hit to the, the business reputation of these manufacturers if these backdoors were discovered in chips they had produced. What's more likely is that these manufacturers could be directed to sort of quietly produce uh, more chips for use in Chinese mining facilities, not make the same increase in production available to uh, global miners, and thereby sort of quietly increase China's proportional control over Bitcoin. Uh, the next capability is uh, regulatory authority. And what's particularly um, interesting and, and a little dangerous about regulatory authority in China is, is how tightly consolidated it is. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, we, we've really seen this around the financial sector in particular. Much more broadly, uh, we've seen it at the national level. Uh, president Xi abolished term limits last year and, and became essentially uh, president for life. And we've seen this authority demonstrated uh, probably most visibly in the Chinese uh, Bitcoin exchange sector. So this chart in the bottom right here shows the percentage of Bitcoin exchanged um, with different currencies. The blue is uh, Chinese yuan, the green is all other currencies combined. And you can see that there were you know, several years of, of 
you can't really characterize that as steady growth, but growth of some sort with a few peaks and spikes. Uh, and throughout 2016, uh, well over 90% of all global Bitcoin exchange transactions were either to or from Chinese yuan. And this was the case right up until the Chinese government rolled out uh, firm regulations basically banning uh, the use of Bitcoin as a financial instrument in China. And you can see that over the course of basically just a few months after this regulation rolled out, the Chinese exchange sector was decimated from above 90% of the global market share to below 1%. The other place we've seen this capability deployed is in manipulation of uh, mining power in China. So for years, the Chinese government was offering uh, all kinds of incentives to miners to uh, build centers and invest broadly in mining operations in China. And these were things like discounted prices on land, discounted energy prices, uh, and other types of sort of tax breaks. And so this fueled uh, this really steady growth of the Chinese mining sector over the last few years. But very recently, uh, China has actually announced plans to reverse course and start using these same levers to scale down uh, the domestic Bitcoin mining industry. And so the, the point of this and what connects these topics is really just uh, the ability of central regulators in China to manipulate the size of the domestic Bitcoin sector, which is quite a large proportion of Bitcoin as a whole, uh, either in, in one direction or another. Uh, the last capability that's relevant to China's control over Bitcoin is their control over internet traffic. And this is relevant because Bitcoin depends on fast peer-to-peer -peer data propagation in order for uh, the consensus process to be fair. So if one region has the ability to control this flow of traffic, uh, that's con certainly concerning. And uh, China does have that capability. Uh, for traffic that's flowing between China and the rest of the world, they have a few uh, powerful tools for control. Uh, the best known is the Great Firewall, which can do uh, packet inspection and injection into TCP streams. There's another slightly lesser known tool that's uh, been called the Great Cannon, which can actually tamper with packets in transit. Uh, the, the main capability that I've seen uh, people discuss this being used for is like a, a DOS attack where you can just redirect a bunch of incoming packets to some uh, target service. Uh, so you have both uh, what are called um, in-path capabilities to tamper with packets in transit and on-path capabilities to uh, capture packets and then analyze them later. These tools can also perform active probing of connection endpoints in order to uh, sort of target and block specific services. This has been done with Tor in the past. Uh, and then uh, it can also be used to simply slow the flow of traffic uh, to or from certain foreign services. And we've seen this done with uh, foreign news services. And the idea here is that if it's 10 times slower to access you know, the New York Times than uh, other types of uh, domestic uh, news sources, uh, Chinese users just won't access those services. You don't have to actually block them. You can just slow the traffic. So these are the capabilities that they have to affect cross-border traffic. Uh, for domestic traffic, there's a little bit less uh, sort of formal research done, but very broadly speaking, um, domestic internet service providers do perform surveillance and censorship of traffic uh, on behalf of the Chinese government. So uh, this internet censorship has had uh, a measurable and, and noticeable effect on Bitcoin in the past, and specifically it, it was on uh, transaction throughput. So uh, what this chart shows is the percentage of all of the Bitcoin blocks being uh, found and committed to the main chain that were empty. And there's a few sort of weird spikes in the beginning, 2011, 2012, when uh, mining wasn't that diversified. But uh, after Bitcoin really took off and began to grow, this rate stayed really steady at around 1%. This until uh, the spike you can see in this chart around 2015 and 2016. So uh, when we dug into this trend, what we noticed was that virtually the entire increase in empty blocks was coming from uh, Chinese mining pools. Uh, this chart shows uh, the blue line is uh, the percentage of empty blocks produced by Chinese mining pools as a percentage of the blocks they're finding, and uh, the red line is the same data for uh, non-Chinese pools. So on average, during this time period, uh, Chinese mining pools were producing between 5 and 7% empty blocks, while non-Chinese pools were staying roughly constant. And there were a few particular outliers, uh, Ant Pool and BW Pool, that were producing as high as 12% uh, empty blocks per day during this time period. So, you know, the question is sort of why would Chinese miners do this? Uh, obviously, when you produce an empty block, uh, you're losing out on the transaction fees that you might be able to, to gain from including transactions in a block. But these are fairly insignificant compared to the block reward, uh, but they are, they are something. I mean, they are a financial incentive. Uh, and uh, what we found is that uh, this is a strategy that can be used to counteract a disadvantage that Chinese miners uh, experience due to the traffic delays introduced by uh, cross-border uh, traffic censorship and surveillance. So there was uh, a study conducted um, right around the same time that this empty block peak was going on that found that propagation of full Bitcoin blocks, which are one megabyte in size or were at the time, 
uh, across, the, across the Great Firewall was slowed by 450% compared to propagation between nodes that were on the same side of the Great Firewall. So this is an explicit disadvantage for Chinese miners because um, sort of assuming that the majority of hash power was not located in China at this time, which seems likely, uh, if a Chinese miner and a miner outside of China find a valid next block at the same time, the miner outside has uh, an advantage in more quickly propagating their block to a majority of the network and sort of winning the consensus race. So one way to account for this disadvantage is to produce smaller blocks, and empty blocks are much smaller than full-size blocks, but of course they're also detrimental to Bitcoin because they reduce its overall transaction throughput. And given the amount of effort in the community right now to scale up the transaction throughput of, of Bitcoin, you know, this is, this is a real problem. Uh, so what finally ended this spike was the introduction of a protocol upgrade into the Bitcoin client called Compact Block Relay. And what this did was allow miners to send tiny sketches of blocks that on average are only about 15 kilobytes in size, as opposed to the full data of the block. So um, sort of generally speaking, this made uh, propagation speed for Bitcoin blocks independent of, of how large they were, how many transactions they contained, and correspondingly, the, the empty blocks being produced by Chinese miners subsided almost immediately after this uh, protocol upgrade was introduced. Um, so the point of this is just to see that you know, this internet censorship uh, can have an effect on, on, on Bitcoin on a global level, uh, even though in this case it was most likely unintentional uh, by the Chinese government and by regulators, uh, this makes it easy to see how this capability could be leveraged to have a serious intentional effect. Okay, so uh, we talked a little about political goals and incentives and about uh, specific technical and regulatory capabilities. Um, the, the meat of our work, and we have a paper that uh, summarizes all of this that I'll put a link up to at the end. Uh, the meat is a threat taxonomy that connects these capabilities and motivations to the vast research that's been done on Bitcoin's security and on its uh, threat profile. So our full paper shows, I think it's like 17 unique attacks that uh, we argue that China is uh, motivated and also capable of, of pulling off. Uh, but because I only have eight minutes left, I'm going to just overview the classes of attacks and uh, give a few examples in each category. Uh, so the first class of attacks are censorship attacks. And the idea here is just to you know, prevent certain transactions uh, from being accepted into the blockchain. This could be based on really any property of the transaction, uh, the source or the recipient of the funds, or even the miner who found the block that the transaction is uh, contained in. And these could achieve a few different goals for China. Uh, they could be used for regulatory enforcement uh, to uh, you know, freeze the funds of people who are committing financial crimes using Bitcoin. It could be used sort of as an assertion of ideology, again, to demonstrate uh, that uh, China's centralized control uh, paradigm is, is more powerful than the decentralized control paradigm, and, and censoring uh, particular Bitcoin users would, would be a pretty effective way of demonstrating that. And then finally, it could be used uh, as part of the, the foreign influence uh, goal that I mentioned earlier, um, possibly to target specific use, Bitcoin users in foreign countries and prevent them from, from moving funds. So um, the, the sample attacks I want to highlight here uh, are two attacks that rely on, uh, they achieve the same goal, but they rely on China controlling a different percentage of hash power. So because we don't have quite a firm number on the exact amount of hash power that China can control, in our paper we separate these attacks broadly into three classes, uh, either a, sort of a high threshold for, um, for China's hash power, which would put them at a majority share, uh, a medium threshold, which is close to a majority share, but, but not quite over 50%, or then a low threshold where they, there are attacks they could pull off with even 25 or 30% of the network hash power. So a punitive forking attack is very simple. Uh, anytime an offending transaction enters the blockchain, uh, Chinese miners fork, uh, and therefore uh, the transaction uh, never reaches consensus, uh, or if it does, uh, that history is overwritten. This attack requires China to have a majority of the hash power, but there's another attack uh, known as a feather forking attack, which uh, Joe mentioned earlier in his talk. Uh, and this is actually uh, a way of achieving a, a very similar effect with significantly less than half of the full network hash power. So the idea here is that China could just announce their intention to fork any time uh, blocks with a certain property um, or transactions with a certain property are, are submitted. And other miners would be incentivized to follow this censorship rule in order to avoid their blocks getting orphaned if they, if they include those transactions. The next class of attacks are de-anonymization, uh, and the idea here is to uh, connect a particular Bitcoin address or a cluster of addresses to uh, a particular real-world person. Uh, these, again, could achieve a couple of different goals for China. Um, obviously, uh, if you want to prosecute someone for financial crimes, you need to know, uh, you know their, their real identity, not their Bitcoin address. Uh, so for, it could be used for regulatory enforcement, uh, and it also could be used, again, as sort of an, an assertion of centralized ideology, uh, perhaps to unmask uh, dissidents who are using Bitcoin to uh, avoid um, 
Chinese uh, capital regulations. And uh, these attacks rely broadly on China's internet censorship and surveillance uh, capabilities. So uh, very simply by uh, observing the domestic flow of Bitcoin traffic, China could identify which IP addresses uh, Bitcoin transactions are identifying, are uh, emanating from, excuse me. And then they could go to the domestic internet service providers and say, you know, uh, uh, we compel you to unmask uh, the real uh, person that you've assigned this IP address to. And in doing that, they could connect Bitcoin activity to uh, real world users fairly easily. Uh, the third class of attacks are uh, very broadly destabilization attacks. There's a bunch of ways in which uh, Bitcoin could be destabilized by a powerful adversary. Uh, simply by sort of increasing the, the frequency of forks, you can cause miners to waste a lot of effort and, and possibly uh, uh, um, cause them to either, either quit mining Bitcoin or, or, or figure out some new strategies. Um, and the other option is to pull off like a really high visibility attack, like a double spend, which would destroy public faith in Bitcoin as uh, a, a free medium of exchange. So uh, the sample attack I want to highlight here is called a balance attack. And what's interesting about this attack is that it demonstrates the power of an adversary with high hash rate combined with control over network flows. So um, very briefly, briefly, the idea here is that China could partition the Bitcoin network between uh, miners inside of China and miners outside of China using the Great Firewall. And they could then issue conflicting transactions to the mining group outside of China. So uh, two transactions that uh, would produce a double spend. And then basically they could wait to see uh, you know, which one of these forks takes off. Uh, the, the outside mining power is gonna be divided into two pools now. Uh, and then uh, once one of the transactions reaches consensus, China could uh, combine their domestic hash power with uh, the other fork and use it to um, sort of outpace the, the previous fork and, and pull off a double spend attack. So again, the point here is just that uh, additionally controlling the flow of uh, Bitcoin data over the network uh, can help you pull off a double spend attack with significantly less than 50% of the total network hash rate. The last uh, class of attacks we identify are attacks that can disrupt competing miners. Uh, and this could be done either to uh, increase China's proportional control over Bitcoin to make the other attacks easier, uh, or again, as, as part of a, a foreign influence campaign to target a country where Bitcoin mining is a significant economic sector. Uh, and the sample attack here is, is a very well-known one called block withholding. Uh, the idea is that uh, either the, the domestic hash power located in China or the miners that contribute to pools that are controlled by Chinese managers could be tasked to work on jobs for uh, some competing pool, some non-Chinese pool. And they would submit partial shares when they find them. And depending on the, the payout structure of that pool, they would maybe be able to claim their rewards right away. Uh, but they wouldn't submit the full blocks when they find them. So the overall profits of this pool would be damaged. And uh, in the long run, it might cause the miners in that pool to abandon it for some other more profitable pool, uh, maybe even a Chinese one. So that's how it could be used to uh, increase China's proportional control over Bitcoin. Uh, so as I said, this is just a, a short snippet of uh, our, our full uh, table in our paper. I'll put a link up on the last slide in case you're interested in downloading it. It's, it's currently under peer review, um, but uh, we have it hosted on, on uh, archive. So uh, in summary, what we found is that uh, China really is a, a pretty credible threat to Bitcoin uh, across a, a wide number of dimensions. Uh, we've seen some interference in the past, both regulatory and technical, but their capabilities far exceed what's been demonstrated so far. So uh, the goal of this research was not to, to vilify China or, or anything like that, but just to provide a clear threat model that can help researchers design mitigations to um, this specific threat and other types of serious, powerful state-level threats that might emerge in the future. Thank you very much.